Right, hello everyone from Math 1340 Statistics. It's Professor Wenson here again with a video on your Newton Alta homework, uh, section 7.1, titled The Central Limit Theorem for Sample Means or Averages. All right, so in this section we're going to learn about something called the Central Limit Theorem. Well, the Central Limit Theorem for Means uh, there's also a central limit theorem for uh, sums, a central limit theorem for proportions. Um, we're only going to be looking at the central limit theorem for means and later the central limit theorem for proportions. Um, so if you ever come across some stuff involving the central limit theorem for sums in your um, OpenStax book, you can skip that stuff. We're, we're, not, we're not covering the central limit theorem for sums, unfortunately. Alright, so this is first objective. There are several objectives, I think four objectives in this section. Uh, this one here, use the central limit theorem for means to find the sample mean and sample standard deviation. Okay, so first off, what is this? central limit theorem for means. So let's see if we can read about it. All right. First time I'm seeing this objective, let's go to more instruction and view instruction. All right. Now they have a video here. I'll read off what it what the central limit theorem for means states. Okay. You can watch the video on your own of course and do your own reading. Hopefully, hopefully you've read section 7.1 uh, from the OpenStax book before coming here. All right, so the central limit theorem is uh, the fact that the distribution of the sample mean of a population becomes closer to the normal distribution as the sample size increases. Uh, you'll see the central limit theorem abbreviated CLT a lot. All right, so you see CLT Central Limit Theorem. All right, and the Central Limit Theorem for means says that if you keep drawing larger and larger samples from some population and calculate the means of those samples, the sample means will form their own normal distribution or bell curve. Okay, and I'll draw some pictures as to what that means when we get to some problems. All right, so for instance here. So the student test scores, all right, so test scores for a nationwide standardized tests have an unknown distribution with a mean 259 and a standard deviation 38 points. A sample with size, you know, little n equals 55. Remember little n usually represented the size of a sample that you pulled from a population. So a sample with size 55 was randomly drawn from the population. So using the central limit theorem for means, what is the mean for the sample mean distribution? Okay, so I'm going to go into draw, I'm going to draw some pictures here. Talking about ho hopefully I can explain in a way that makes sense to you, the central limit theorem. Right. So the central limit theorem. Now this is, again, this one's for means, where we look at the means of samples. Uh, and there's, like I said, there's another one later where we'll take a look at proportions or percentages. Um, you'll see that in in a, in a few sections, you know, later this week. All right. So here's a little picture, a little diagram of what's going on. So let's say this little bubble I'm putting up here represents the population. And say our, our population is related to a random variable called x. So x could be, you know, heights of people, 
in this case it's in the example we're talking about here, it's test scores. Uh, in, the, in the particular problem that we were just looking at in the assignment, it's nationwide standardized test scores, you know, for, for a bunch of students. Now, the population has a mean, you know, the, 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 all these test scores have a mean, right? Mu. Now, we're going to start differentiating between the average of one variable versus the average of another variable by putting subscripts on the me on the means and standard deviations. So I'm not going to just going to write mu for the population of these test scores, the mean of the test scores. I'm going to put mu x. Right, remember, x here represents these student test scores. All right, and they told us that you know the mean for these student test scores, the population was 259. And the standard deviation, remember that sigma for the test scores. So sigma x, right? Again, I'm going to put now I'm going to start putting subscripts on the mu and the sigma to, to let you know the mean of what group, the standard deviation of what group. And so the standard deviation of these test scores was 38 points. All right. So then from the population. All right, from from the population, samples are taken. And in this case, the samples have a size of 55. So we start taking these samples. And there's a sample one, you know, here's sample one. And, you know, it has a mean. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna be focusing on the, the means here. Let's say it has a mean of x bar one, right? This is the mean of the first sample, x, x bar number one. I can pull another sample of size 55. You know, say here's sample two, and and it has a mean x bar two. All right. And uh, there's another sample, uh, sample three, and it also has a mean, right? The mean of this sample again. All these are of size 55. All, right. all these are groups of 55. X bar three, and so on. And I keep doing this, and I do this. As, I can do this as much as often as many times as I wish until I reach all possible samples of size 55, right? Now that's going to be probably hard to do re in real life, right? But we're imagining, imagine all possible samples. So imagine you're taking all possible samples of size 55 here. And then what we're going to look at is the group of all these sample means. So I'm going to write the means again. Right? So we have this group of means, which are you know the x bars, right? If the original population, the test scores was x, the means will be x bars. These are the you know the average test scores for groups of 55. That's what x bar will represent the average test scores for you know groups of 55 students. So I have x bar number one, x bar number two, x bar number three, you know x bar sub sub k, and so on. And I get this new group, a new group, you know, for, again from from these sample means here, we're taking these sample means and throwing them into a new group called x bar, right? The original population, x. The, this group of means, sample means, x bar. This 
has its own distribution. This group of means. Now here's what the central limit theorem states. I'll do this off to the side here. In the CLT, central limit theorem. So there's a couple parts to this. Part one. If the original population, so x, x represents the scores from the original population. If x is normally distributed with mean mu sub x and standard deviation sigma sub x, or two, if the sizes of my samples are large enough, now they're saying greater than or equal to 30, which, you know, I'm pulling samples of size 55 here, which are definitely greater than or equal to 30, uh, or if the samples I pull are large enough, then the distribution of the sample means, right, all these sample means for you know all possible samples of size n, will be approximately normal or normally distributed with a mean called you know mu sub x bar. Right, again, it's the the mean of the means, the mean of all these this group of means here and a standard deviation of sigma sub x bar. And how these are calculated are related to the original mean and standard deviation with the mean of the means, right? The mu sub x bar. This is gonna be equivalent to the mean of the original population. So mu sub x bar is equivalent to mu x. The, the mean of this group of sample means will be equivalent to the mean of this group that we pulled all the test score, all the scores from. And the standard deviation of this group of means, the standard deviation of the distribution of this mean, these means over here, will be the standard deviation of the original population divided by the square root of the size of the samples that we were taking, divided by the square root of n. All right, so I'm gonna put this in a box. I know it's gonna be kind of cluttered here and I apologize for that. But this is huge, okay? This is, this is called the central limit theorem for means. I'll just put in the lower left corner here. So, so if the original population is normally distributed or not worrying about the population distribution, if I pull samples from the population that are you know, size 30 or greater, which we've done here, then the distribution of all the sample means, right, the average test scores for groups of 55, will be normally distributed with mean, you know, mu sub x bar, standard deviation sigma x bar, where the mean of the means is going to be the mean of the original population. And the standard deviation of this group of means will be the standard deviation of the original population divided by the square root of n. All right, so it's going to be small. This, the standard deviation of this group of means will be smaller than the standard deviation of the group that we pulled samples from. All right, because these will all be actually tighter and closer together. So their, their standard deviation will be smaller. All right, so keep these formulas in mind that where my fingers are pointing at the bottom here. The mean of the x bar distribution is exactly the same as the mean of the x distribution, the original. The standard deviation of the x bar distribution is the standard deviation of the original divided by the square root of the size of the samples that were taken. Okay. All right, so back on this particular problem. All right, back to this particular problem. 
So again, I'll read through. The student test scores, you know, have an unknown distribution, so you don't know if they're normal or not, but it doesn't matter because the sample size is greater than or equal to 30. Larger sample size you take, the closer the distribution of the means will be to being normal. That's what the central limit theorem states. That's what I wrote. All right, so the distribution of the original population is two, has a mean of 259, a standard deviation of 38. And I'm pulling these samples of size, you know, 55. And it says, you know, what is the mean for the sample mean distribution? All right, so what is over here for this group of means? What's the mean for the group of means? And like I said, this should be also 259. It'll be equivalent to the mean from the original population. The thing that's going to change is the standard deviation. It'll get t it'll get smaller. It'll get tighter. All these values will be tighter, more tightly packed than the original values themselves. Uh, the standard deviation for this distribution of the means will be 38. The original population's standard deviation divided by the square root of 55. Right, divided by the square root of uh, the sample size that we took. Right, we took sizes. Size is 55. Now they're only asking for the mean, right? So it's the mean for the sample mean distribution, the mean of those X bar scores will be 259, same as the mean of the original population. And I'll draw some pictures of distributions coming up too. Um, all right, so here, different question, same kind of problem though. You know, student test scores, nationwide standardized tests have an unknown distribution with a mean of 230 and a standard deviation of 34. This time, samples of size, you know, a sample of size 45 is randomly taken from the population and the mean is taken. Uh, using the central limit theorem for means, what is the standard deviation for the, the sample means, for those X bars? Right, the X's, the test scores, have a mean of 230 and a standard deviation of 34. But, you know, these X bars, these means, you know, what, what, what are the average test scores for groups of 45 students? Those averages have a mean of 230, but a standard deviation of 34 divided by the square root of 45, right? So I'm going to pull up my calculator, and the mean will be the same, 230. But the standard deviation for the means, the standard deviation for those average test scores for groups of 45 will be the standard deviation of the original population, 34, divided by the square root of the sample size. So this is the, the standard deviation of the new distribution, the distribution of the means. So about 5.07, right? if I round to two decimal places, and that's that one there, that choice. So knowing those two formulas, those two relationships between the original population and then that group of means that we're looking at, averages, um, will be huge. Right? Okay. So here's a, another one like this. I'll keep going with this. So a donut shop that specializes in you know, unique donuts made from potatoes wants to learn more about their business costs. All right, so past data reveals that the cost for 50 pounds of potatoes has a mean of $75 with a standard deviation of 13. The normal distribution for the population is shown by the dotted black line. Right. So the dotted black line is the normal distribution for the population, the original population. Right. With mean 75, standard deviation 13. The donut shop plans to take a random sample of 31 such 50 pound bags, so 31 bags of potatoes. So their, their N, their value of N is 31. And calculate the mean cost of the sample to compare to the known cost. 
Right, so they're taking 31 of these bags, taking the average cost, you know, add them up, divide by 31, add up all the costs, divide by 31. Compute the mean and standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the sample means. So basically the distribution of X bar, right, the distribution of all those sample means for samples of size 31, right? If I were to look at all possible samples of size 31, you know, 31 bags of potatoes, what's the average cost? Thir take another 31 bags of potatoes, what's the average cost? You know, if I could do that and look at all those averages and the distribution of all those averages, what would be the mean and, and standard deviation for that, that distribution? Now remember, uh, central limit theorem here, right? we're pulling samples of size 30 or greater, totally fine. Also, you know, they, they told us the original population was normal. So if the original population is normal, it doesn't matter what size samples you take. Uh, the, the distribution of the means will also be normal. The central limit theorem will hold. Um, so the mean of the new one is going to be 75 as well. All right, so I'll move the, see the mean of the X bars, right? The mean value for the averages of, you know, 31 bags of potatoes is 70. What did I say, 71? Yeah, seven, no, $75 as well. And the standard deviation, uh, we're going to have to calculate and round to the nearest tenth. So remember, standard deviation of the means, right? The standard deviation of the groups of means is going to be the standard deviation of the original population. So that was 13, the $13, divided by the square root of the sizes of the samples, right, that were taken. And we took a sample of 31 bags of potatoes. And then to the nearest tenth, uh, that'd be 2.3. Right. So down here, back on this graph, I moved the standard deviation over to, to where it's 2.3. There you go. So again, the black distribution is for X, is for just the cost of potatoes. The red distribution is for X bar, which is the average cost of 31 bags of potatoes. Totally different. All right. One more time. The black dotted distribution is for the cost of, you know, one bag of potatoes. The red distribution is for the average cost of 31 bags of potatoes. All right, so same mean and should have a smaller standard deviation. Okay. Alrighty. All right, so this one, this might look familiar uh, from the chapter six material finding probabilities, you know, areas under normal curves using a table. I'll also show you the calculator as well. All right. Uh, so this question, what is the probability that the sample mean for a sample of size 31, all right, so it's the same thing with the bags of potatoes here. Uh, what's the probability that the sample mean for a sample of size 31 will be more than 76? So we're looking at, uh, that that's the red distribution, right? Because you're talking about the mean value, the mean cost of 31 bags of potatoes. So you're not looking at the black distribution, you're looking at the red one, right? And I'll draw this up, right? And I'll show you how we can use the table, and also I can use your calculator uh, to make it real quick and find this, find this probability. Now remember, probability corresponds to area under a curve. All right, so back on my pa uh, piece of paper. So remember the dis this X bar that we're talking about now. Right? X bar is a normal distribution. Oh, and I'll tell you what X bar represents, right? X bar represents, you know, the average cost for 31 bags of potatoes. Or N equals 31 here. Right. And we saw just a second ago on that on that drawing, right, when I move my when I move the little cur uh, dots around, 
the it's normally you know x bar here is going to be normally distributed with a mean of seventy-five dollars, and the standard deviation, you know, when we when we rounded it, uh, it was two point three. Right? It was, right. So here we go. I'm going to draw this. You got a number line. Now remember, let's say this number line represents possible different values of you know the average cost for 31 bags of potatoes possible different values for x bar got a you know uh, now mine doesn't look probably exactly like theirs but i got this you know symmetrical bell shaped curve above it <coughs> below the peak this is where that mu sub x bar will be right that was 75 and then underneath the inflection points where one standard deviation above and below. So that's again inflection points are where it goes from curving down to curving up. It's over and then curving up to curving down. That's over here and here. And you saw those on the picture as well. And this is a crappy hand drawing. These should be the same distance apart. Uh, so this would be like you know this is one standard deviation above, so 77.3. This is one standard deviation below, so 72.7. And then I could keep making off, marking off different stuff. Um, now, we are asked, what's the probability? And so we're asked to find this. What's the probability that a sample mean, right, that x bar for a sample of size 31, what's the probability that the average cost for, a thir for 31 bags of potatoes will be more and seventy-six dollars. They're asking us this, and I'm writing out in symbolism here. So remember, this corresponds to an area. Now I've got my distribution for x bar drawn. Now where is you know seventy-six? Let's see, seventy-six would be somewhere in here. Right, there's seventy-six. So we're talking this area. So that's greater than more than seventy-six. So we're talking the area to the right. Of 76. Now, if I want to use that table, I can't just yet. See how the table is for your Z scores? It's for the stand, you know, th these are values corresponding to the standard normal distribution, not the one I currently have. All right. This is not the standard normal. Remember, the standard normal has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, not not 75 and, and 2.3. So what we do is standardize this distribution. Remember, ch change things to their z scores. So if I want to use the table, I'm going to standardize this x bar. So here's how you do that, right? We're going to change it to Z. Now remember, Z, a Z score is, you know, I'm taking a, a little X bar. I'm taking a, one of the, I'm taking our average here of 76, and you subtract the mean of the X bars, and then divide it by the standard deviation of the X bars, right? So I take a particular value, I subtract the mean, divided by, you know, the standard deviation. Remember, Z scores. All right, now I'll get this picture. Right, so we're transforming x bar here, the distribution of the means, to the standard normal. That was the normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So, there's, you know, so now x bar has become z, and kind of got a normal normal curve here. Mean of zero. Underneath that should be zero, and then how about our 76? What would 76 change to? So what's the z-score for for 76? So for x bar equals 76, right, for x bar equals 76 here, the z-score would be 76 minus you know 75 divided by the standard deviation. Now the standard deviation was 2.3, 2.3, and I'm going to round this you know because my table. Because my table here 
has, you know, to the hundredths place, you see it's like 0 0.41, 0 0.42, all my, all my z scores here are to the hundredths place. I'm going to round this to the hundredths place. Now what's, basically what's 1 divided by 2.3, pull the calculator up, 1 divided by 2.3, approximately 0. Point, now if I round that to two decimal places, that's 0. 0.43. So this z score of 76, uh, sorry, this x bar, this average of 76 on the original becomes 0.43 on this new graph I'm making with the z scores. And we're finding the area to the right of 76, that should be exactly the same as the area to the right of 0.43 on the standard normal distribution. All right, so now I'm finding this. Get rid of the calculator here. So I'm going to look up 0.43. Alright, 0.43 on my table. Now remember, on the table, the numbers given to you are areas to the left. So I look up 0 0.43 on the table. So 0 0.43, that's giving me this value here, 0.6664. This 0.6664 is the area to the left of the z-score 0.43. So back on my paper. So that's this area here. So the area to the left is 0 0.6664. And remember that the total area under the entire curve has to be 1. So this area plus you know the area to the right needs to be 1. So I'm just going to subtract this from 1. Right, so this area here, the probability I'm looking for is equal to 1 minus 0.6664. So that would be 0 0.3336. Right, the to this plus that would be equal to 1. Uh, so that is what I'm going to enter. Right, you, uh, just you know, they said use the use the standard deviation and mean above. Use this table. Ooh, they wanted to enter as a percentage. Okay, use the results from the above. Round your answer to the nearest percent, the nearest whole percent. So this is uh, you know, this is thirty three point three six percent, which rounds to you no, know, the nearest percent would be thirty three percent. So about a third of the entire area is under that under that uh, to the right of 0.43, meaning that about a third of the entire area, and it's the same area here. This is approximately 33%. Is to the right of 76 on that original drawing. Right. So rounding to the nearest percent, 33. Submit. Great. Now, let me show you how you could have also done this on the calculator. And you've seen this before. Right? You've seen me do this. So going back to my paper, here was the original drawing. Right? We had the, the average cost for 31 bags of potatoes. This X bar was normally distributed with a mean of 75, standard deviation of 2.3. And I wanted to know what was the probability of getting taking a sample of 31 bags of potatoes and having their average cost being greater than $76 that's this region here. Um, I'll pull up the calculator and hopefully you remember this from you know chapter 6 sections. We can find the area under a normal curve very easily on our calculator. Have it do it for us. So remember above the variables button above vars there was it says DISTR those second distributions and then to find the area under a normal curve we we're going to that normal CDF and then it asks, okay, what's the lower value in the region you're trying to find the area of? Well, this region here, the lowest value, the left value here is 76. So I enter 76. And then what's the, now if you're on an older calculator, you're going to have to go 76, comma, and then put in the upper value. Now, there, now notice this region here, there is no upper value. 
So to indicate that, I'm just going to put some really, really large positive numbers. So something that's very, very many, many standard deviations above 75. So that way I, you know, guarantee I got basically all the way to the right, you know. So I'll put like five nines, you know, some big positive number for the upper value. So again, in the older ones, you'll have to put 76, comma, some big positive value, comma, and then, you know, it's not the standard normal, right? They have mean zero standard deviation one here. The mean is 75, 75, and then, you know, comma on the old ones. And the standard deviation for this distribution, the distribution of the means for groups of size 31 was 2.3. And I'm getting C. Now, this is a little more accurate because I didn't round, you know, nothing got rounded. You know, I rounded my z-score to 0.43. They're not doing that in the calculator, right? They use more exact values. But look at this area, 0.3318. That's 33.18 or 19%. If I round that to the nearest percentage, that's 33%, exactly what I said here, exactly. So we can use the calculator to help us, you know, find areas under these normal distributions. And it'll save you some time too, because like, you know, you won't have to do z-scores like you normally would. You know, if you if you use these tables, okay, if you use these tables that they're providing, see the z there, you're going to have to change things to z-scores if you're going to use these tables. All right, I'd rather just pull up the calculator myself. All right, save some time. All right, let me go through all that. Same stuff I showed you earlier. Cool. All right, now this objective coming up. All right, understand sampling distributions in the sense. All right, so this is just, again, introducing you once more to the, uh, it's a very important topic. It comes up a lot. Uh, but once more, we're being introduced to the central limit theorem for means. So I'll go to more instruction again and see what else they have to say about it, if it's anything different than what I said. I mean, it should, it's the same thing, really, but... Alright, so, uh, yeah. So the sampling distribution of the means. Remember that little picture I had up earlier where I had a population and I said pull samples, pull samples, pull samples, and look at the group of means? That's exactly what's being described here. So again, suppose five, you know, the population, suppose the population of scores was 12, you know, 12, 16, 13, 9, and 7. And I took all the combination, you know, I took just samples of size 2. So they took all these samples of size 2. You know, there's 25 samples here of size 2. Took their means. See all these means in the third column and the sixth column here, all these means. And then if you look at these means, and then, you know, they made a little, they made, for, for these 25 means, they went and made a histogram. And you see how close, to, now it's not normal exactly. But you see how it's, you know, it's getting, getting close, bell shape. What the central limit theorem states is that the larger your sample size, you know, if I, instead of taking samples of size 2, if I took samples of size 10, if I took 10 of these scores at a time and look at their averages, then looked at those means, those means would have a histogram even closer to a bell shape. The larger, the, uh, no matter what the population is, the larger the sample sizes you take, and then you look at the means of those samples, the means of those samples, if you were to make a histogram or some sort of graph relating the shape, the shape will get closer to being bell-shaped, being normal. So this one was, you know, reasonably close. It's, you know, it's kind of bell-shaped, looking going up and then going down. Um, and then they have you play around with things here, all right? So here, the, the histogram above, above, Oh, yeah, this histogram above shows the sampling distribution for samples of size 2, right? When, when Again, when they're pulling, you know, they're taking this population of scores, these five scores, pulling out two of them, taking two scores, and they can repeat things, see 9 and 9 here. Taking out samples of 2, looking at their means, and then making a histogram, you know, for those 25 means. Uh, but what would happen to the histogram shape if we took increasingly larger samples. So move the circle on the slider to see what happens. So like I was mentioning earlier, now what if, you know, 
See, if I just, uh, if they just took samples of size one, see the histogram's not really looking great. Not looking very normal shape, but then, you know, the si you saw what happened with size two getting more normal. If I took samples of size 10, come on, look at that. More closer, you know, closer to bell shaped. Samples of size 40 from that population. Look at that. Even better, a better fit to a bell shape. All right, if I took 100 values, samples of size 100, look at that, that's really close. And, you know, 300, 1,000, a million. Now, the, the larger samples you take, and then look at the means of those samples, that group of means will have a distribution that gets closer and closer to being normal, being perfect, you know, symmetrically bell-shaped. Uh, so they explain all that here. Talk about how the mean of the the mean of the x bars is going to be the mean of the population. The standard deviation of the means, the x bars, is the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of n. I've already explained all that. Uh, that's the standard deviation, also known as the standard error of the mean. Uh, then there, here's the explanation of the central limit theorem. Again, now I wrote this out on paper, right? See, bowling samples of size 30, the sampling distribution becomes closer to normal as n increases. Right, the, the larger sample sizes you take, the larger sample sizes you take, and look at all those means of those samples. The group of means gets closer and closer to having a normal distribution, right, with this mean and this standard deviation up here, standard error. All right, so they read through. You can read through all this on your own. Examples, examples. Let's get to a problem. So here is a question, uh, the average credit card debt owed by Americans is $6,375 with a standard deviation of $1,200. So suppose a random sample of 36 Americans is selected. All right, identify each of the following. Now remember mu here, now see that they have mu x bar, that's for the average of 36 Americans, x bar is the mean or the average debt for groups of 36. So if they don't put anything underneath it, then it's for the original population. So mu here is the mean, the average credit card debt owned by a single American, and that's, you know, $6,375. This sigma with no subscript is the standard deviation for the debt for just one American, you know, or just the average American. And that, they said that that was twelve hundred dollars. All right. Then the n here is you know. All right. Now I'm pulling a sample of Americans. Right. Uh, well, what's the sample size? They said you know. Suppose a random sample of thirty-six Americans. So n is thirty-six. And then what would be the average credit card debt for a groups of thirty-six? All right. If you looked at all, po if you were able to. All right, if you were if you were able to look at all possible groups of 36 Americans and find their average de credit card debt the average of the mean of those averages will be the same or close to the same you know will will approach the mean of the, of the original population so the mean of x bars the mean of those averages will also be 6375 just like the mean of the original population. It's this thing that changes. The standard deviation of all these averages will be the standard deviation of the original population, $1,200, but then divided by the square root of 36. Now the square root of 36 is just 6, so 1,200 divided by 6, no, that's just 200. So the standard deviation for the averages, for, you know, for groups of size 36, for the average debt for groups of size 36, the standard deviation for those averages would be $200, not 1200 And it should be smaller. And again, they go through the explanation and the formulas again uh, down here. 
Right, this one's a, one of those select all that apply deals. So suppose the heights of all basketball players are normally distributed with a mean of 72 inches and a population standard deviation of 1.5 inches. So that's mu and sigma. All right, so that's for single basketball players, right? not groups of them. But now we're talking about groups. Right? If a sample of 15, now I know 15 is not greater than 30, but notice, remember I said that if the original population was normally distributed, it doesn't matter what size you take. All right. Now, if they don't mention that the original population is normally distributed, then you should have to take you know, 30 or more in your samples in order for the central limit theorem to apply. But here, population is normally distributed, so I can take a sample of any size, and the central limit theorem will apply. So if a sample of 15 players are selected at random from the population, Select the expected mean of the sampling distribution and standard deviation of the sampling distribution below. So remember, uh, the mean of the the mean of the means at right, the mean. If you looked at all possible groups of 15 players and looked at the average heights of all poss of those groups, right? The average height of these 15, the average height of these 15, the average height of these 15. If you looked at all those averages, all those means the mean of all those means, well, you expect that to be the mean of the original population, so 72. So mu sub x bar should be 72 inches. And then the standard deviation of those means, the standard deviation of those averages, will be the standard deviation of the population, the original population, 1.5, uh, divided by the square root of 15. All right, so let me pull that up. And pull up the calculator. So what's what's come on, turn on, let's go. Right, there we go. One point five, the original standard deviation, divided by the square root of the sample size. So about 0.387, which is this box here. So these are all the only two that apply. I submit and looks good. So again, knowing that, knowing those formulas, you know, where are the, what's the mean of the x bars, what's the standard deviation of the x bars, can be really helpful here. All right. So this one is really no different than earlier. Let me go and wait for some numbers to show up here. Yeah. So I did one like this earlier. All right, so I'm just going to do the cheat. This is exactly the same. As earlier, just make sure you're you know pay attention to numbers. Did a problem like that already. Right, and then this is uh, I think this is yet another one exactly like that. Yeah. It's exactly the same. Just again, different numbers. Pay attention to the numbers. What's you know, what's the original population mean? What's the original population standard deviation? And then you know, what are the group size being taken, and how will that affect the mean and standard deviation of the of the group averages? So I'll cheat on this one to do something more like that. Again, very similar. Okay. Now uh, these last two objectives, I believe, are on finding probability itself, right. finding area under curves. Oh, okay, this is all right. So, do you recall? Hopefully, you recall from uh, chapter six, the section uh, six point one, six point two. There was that inverse norm feature on the calculator. Now I can also use a table. All right, and I'll, I'll use a table here as well. Show you how. But you could, if you were given a probability, you were given an area under the normal curve, then you could find, you know, values on the number line that corresponded to those. Uh, so that's what's, that's what's going on here. You know, use the central limit theorem to find a mean given 
a probability. So we're given an area under the curve, the x bar curve, and we're finding a value on the on the number line that corresponds to that. All right, so I'll show you a couple ways to do this. One's with the table. Right? Again, they got one of these z-score tables here, and another one is with the calculator, which will be a lot easier. And I would recommend just doing that, saving some time. All right, so here a company is offering you know 401k matching for its employees who stay with the company for more than 10 years. The company's CFO finds that the average retirement account holds $490,000 with a standard deviation of $55,000, right? So this is if uh, this is for the individual employees at the company that have been there more than 10 years. Uh, the retirement accounts, their retirement account amounts have a mean of 490,000 and a standard deviation of 55,000. Distributed normally. What amount of money separates the lowest 20% of the means of retirement accounts from the highest 80% in a sampling of 80 employees, right? So if you were to look at groups of 80 employees, take 80 employees, what's their average retirement account amounts, look at another group of 80 employees, what's their average, and if you were to look at like all the averages, the average retirement account amounts for these groups of 80 employees and look at that distribution, what what average what mean value for groups of 80 separates the lowest 20 percent from the highest 80 percent? All right. So again, I'll draw I'll draw a little picture here. Let's get rid of the, get rid of the calculator. All right. So so x bar represents the average. You know, average retirement account amount. I'll just say reti average retirement account for you know a group of 80 employees. And we know from the central limit theorem, and right, because they told us that the uh, original population was normally distributed. Uh, by the central limit theorem, this, uh, this, the distribution of these means, these averages, would be normally distributed with a mean, right, the mean of these means, the mean of these averages being the mean of the original population being $490,000. And the standard deep, right, so I got 490,000, with 490,000 as the mean, and the standard deviation of these means, these averages, is the standard deviation of the original population, so 55,000, divided by the square root of the sample sizes, right? And they we're taking groups of 80 employees. All right. Now, uh, I'm going to round this to like four decimal places, right? So, pull this up. Let's go, uh, so 55,000 divided by the square root of 80. Right, so this is approximately $6,149 and you know, 19 cents. But I'll just go, I'm going to go four decimal places, just double it up. So 1869. Right. 1869. This is dollars, right? Okay. So that's, that's going here. All right. All right. I'll draw a little picture of this. So here's you know different averages for groups of 80, normally distributed, right? So I got again this uh, symmetrical bell shape above it. In the middle here is 490,000, and this should be you know about 6,000. This is a uh, 490,000, 496,149 dollars and 19 cents, and this is 6,000 less and so on, okay? Now we are asked to find a particular average. We're asked to find a particular value for x bar. This is x bar here, Let's separate the bar there. We're asked to find the value that separates the lowest 20% from the highest 80%. Now I know between the one standard deviation away, one, one up and one down is 68%. 
So you'd have 16 over here, 16 over here. So we're in here somewhere. What is this value? Question mark, question mark. What's the value that separates the lowest 20%? Right? So let's say this is 20% over here from the upper 80%. Uh, come on, that's pretty faint, I apologize. At the lowest 20% from the upper 80%. So what, what is this? All right, now if you're gonna try to use those tables, all right, if you're gonna try to use the tables, remember the tables involve z-scores. The tables involve z-scores. So if I wanna use the table that they gave me here, um, I need to convert to uh, the standard normal, right? I need to convert to the standard normal. So I'm gonna standardize this. And we've got this. Okay. So I'd have now we're changing, you know, we converted it to the, the, the standard normal with a mean of zero, standard deviation of one, Z scores, standard normal. Now the middle is zero, right? The Z score of 490,000 be zero. And what we're looking for is what's the Z score that separates the lowest 20% from the highest 80%. All right. So this I can find from the table. All right. Let me show you how. Okay, so I want to find the z-score that has 20% to the left. All right, remember all these numbers in the bulk of the table give me area to the left. Okay. Now, looking in these areas, looking in the, at these numbers, you know, I got 0.212, that's 21.2% to the left, 20.9% uh, to the left, 20.6% to the left, you know, 20.3% to the left, 20.1.198. So somewhere between here and here, somewhere between here and here. Now the closest to 20% is 0.201. All right. Um, so I, I've seen this done a couple ways where you can use the closest or take the between. The z-score, all right, the z-score for this is, you know, negative 0 0.8, 4, and, you know, negative 0 0.85, somewhere in between there. So we could take the average, you know, we could take the average and say, you know, the z-score here is about negative 0 0.845, right, because this is between negative 0 0.84 and negative 0 0.85, right? I'm going right between them. So I'll use that, all right? Now again, you can use the one that's closest, negative 0.84, and I think it'll still work out. Uh, let's see what's going on. Now, this isn't the answer. We don't want the z-score with 20% below and 80% above. I want this average retirement account. What's that score? All right, well, now I just plug stuff in to that z-score formula. Remember the z-score formula was this, you know, the z-score of a particular value was that value, which is some average here, minus the mean of those averages divided by the standard deviation of those averages. Uh, so the z-score we know is negative point eight, uh, or about negative point eight four five equals, you know, I, I, I don't know this score. I don't know that score, the x-bar minus 490,000, right, the, the average, divided by the standard deviation of these means we said was was this 6,149.1869. Right. So then I take this, multiply it over here, then we add 490,000. Right, I'm just gonna do this on the, on the calculator. Pull the calculator up and go 400, all right, so I take uh, 
I'm going to take negative 0.845 times, uh, I guess I could put just the previous answer, right? See, my previous answer is that 6,149, and it's a little more accurate, so previous answer. And then to get the x bar, to get that particular value with 20% below, 80% above, then I would add 490,000. Alright, so that is, so this value right here, this particular, you know, this average retirement account, uh, this, this average for groups of 80, average retirement account, that has 20% below it, 80% above it, is approximately $484,000, cents. because they're asking us to round to two decimal places. Oh, so they want, oh, okay, okay. All right, so they did want the Z score rounded. So lo looking back here, so they say they did want the Z score rounded to two decimal places. So the Z score with 20%, well, again, the closest to 20% here would be the negative 0.84, right? Because that's only one thousandth off. This is 2,000 sauce, so I'll use negative 0.84. Uh, so negative 0 0.84 for the z-score. And then what is the what is that average? All right, so maybe I should pull the calculator up again and just re-enter that with negative 0.84. So I do a negative, oops, 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 oops. So negative 0.84 times and then let's go back and use that number and then plus the 490,000 and see if that gives me all right so all right so this is 484,834 dollars and 68 cents so a little off just making that 0 0.84 and the point 0 0.85 uh, 0.845 and the 0.84 so let's see if that actually works. And let me really double check it by taking negative 0.84, multiplying it by the 50, you know, how I found the standard deviation, 55,000 divided by the square root of 80, because I think that might even be more accurate, and then plus 490,000. All right, so that's about the same thing. So it looks like I'm going to enter here 484,834 point, and then you know two decimal places six eight. All right, hopefully that comes up correct because right, there was a lot of rounding going on there. Let's see. All right, something something went awry. Now, hmm, do they want it without going over? That's the problem I'm trying to see here, because like the negative 0.84 is the closest to 20%, but this is like the closest without going over. I, wanna play, I don't know if they want to play like Price is Right rules here. Okay, I'm curious. I'm going to see their answer. Yeah, so look, all right, so they used negative 0.85 instead of negative 0.84. So it looks like they're doing prices right rules, which means, you know, get as close to but without going over. So when I use negative 0.84 here, see that that's 20.1% that was over 20% to the left, but they want 20% to the left, so they went the closest to without going over. Alright, so and then they did all the same stuff where they multiply. Okay. Okay. Looks like they also rounded the standard deviation to two decimal places. Hmm. And then multiplied that by the standard deviation to added four. So it's all the same calculation. 
just they're doing it a little differently than what I had. All right, so I guess be careful with this one. I'm gonna if we come across another one like this, I'll actually go through it all again just to see if I do it the way they did it here, if it works out, where everything's rounded to two decimal places as you work through, and you don't go over. All right, so here's a similar problem. So this time, so a clothing manufacturer is examining the efficiency of its factories. All of its factories produce an average, right, so it says the mean of the population, 1250 to 1,250 pairs of jeans each month, with a standard deviation, sigma, of 125 pairs of jeans, normally distributed, right, so the original population is normally distributed. So the central limit theorem will apply here no matter what size of sample I'm taking. How many pairs of genes produced separates the lowest 33% of the means of gene production from the highest 67% in a sampling distribution of 12 factories? So the sample size is 12 here, n is 12. All right, so I'm gonna do the same kind of picture where I'm looking at this table, all right, I'm looking at this table and I'm trying to separate the lowest 33% from the highest 67, right? So I'm going to draw a picture again. Another, another bell curve. Oh, and I'll also show you maybe how we can, uh, although based on the way they rounded things, I don't know if the calculator would help you because the calculator might go too accurate. You know, they, they seem to want you to do certain a certain procedure and round round things to certain places. So a calculator might just get you close. All right, so now X bar this time represents the uh, average efficiency of 12, fa the average efficiency rating. No, average efficiency, the average efficiency of a group of 12 factories. That's what X bar represents this time. And by the central limit theorem, you know, sin since the original population is normal, uh, the distribution of these means should be approximately normal with a mean of the mean of the population, which was 1250. And the standard deviation of, you know, the standard deviation of the population 125 pairs of genes divided by the square root of the sample size divided by the square root of 12. Alright. And I'll draw a little picture here to do. So different different averages here for groups of size 12, normally distributed. You know, the middle here is uh, x bar equals, uh, the mean of the x bars is 1250. And we're trying to figure out what value separates the lower 33%, so that'd be over here, What's this value here that separates the lower 33% from the upper 67%? Right, what's the what's that value? Okay. So first, I want to find the let's find the z-score for this on the table. Let's find the z-score for this. All right, so I'm looking at the table now. Remember, the table gives you areas to the left. So I'm looking for the value that's closest to 33% without going, oh, there's exactly 33% right here. See, 0 0.330. So this one doesn't have that issue where I'm close to, but you know, not going over. This is exact. Uh, so I see 0 0.330, 33% to the left. And uh, that would be the z-score of negative 0 0.4, negative 0 0.44, right? If I look at those two column, that that row in this column with the 0.33 in line. So the z-score for that value, all right, this is some sort of x-bar that I don't know, is uh, negative 0 0.44. And then I use a formula, right? Uh, it's X bar minus the mean of the X bars divided by the standard deviation of the X bars. Now the X bar I don't know. The mean 
of the x bars is 1250. The standard deviation of the x bars is 125 divided by the square root of 12. Now uh, I'm going to multiply by this, so we have a, uh, and then add 1250. So the, the, to solve for x bar here, this value is negative 0 0.44 times this 125 over the square root of 12, and then plus 1250. Now I think this will work out. So what I'm going to do now, going back to the website. They said, you know, z score two decimal places. Okay, so that was the negative 0 0.44. Negative 0 0.44. Got that. And that was exact. And I didn't have to worry about going over 20% or 33%. All right, and then round x bar to the nearest whole number. All right, so this won't be so bad, probably as bad as rounded to two decimal places. So let me pull the calculator up. I took that, I took that z score, right, negative 0.44. I multiply by the standard deviation of the x bars, that sigma x bar, which was 125 divided by the square root of 12. And then after that, added the mean of the x bars, added the middle 1250. And rounding this to the nearest whole number is 1,234. All right, so on my paper, all right, this, this mean is 1,234 that separates the lowest 33% from the highest 67%. 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, that worked out. Again, I think it was because you know, it ended up being exact. All right, exact. But if you ever come across a problem like this, like I had earlier, you know, try to just go to as near to it as you can without going over. All right. Now, you could have also done this on the calculator. Again, hopefully it gives me something similar. Right, remember the calculator, if I have a normal distribution and I know an area to the left of some value, I can find that value using the inverse norm. All right, you can use that inverse norm on the calculator. And hopefully that sounds familiar from you know sections 6.1 or 6.2. So remember, I go second to the distributions area, and then right below normal CDF is inverse norm. And then you say, oh, what's the area to the left? 0 0.33, right? 0 0.33. What's the mean of this distribution? 1250. What's the standard deviation of this distribution? That was 125 divided by the square root of 12, and I'm gonna enter it that way, 125 divided by the square root of 12. And see what we get there. See, it's one, two, one, two, three, four point one two. Pretty much the same as the other one, but you know this one involved rounding. But if I rounded that to the nearest whole number, it would be one, two, three, four. So I get exactly the same thing using that inverse norm as well. Uh, I guess yeah. The the only problem was you know what if they want you to round to more decimal places? You see how after a while you know th this inverse norm is much more accurate than when we were rounding and stuff. So you see in the third decimal place they're off a bit. So if I was rounding to two decimal places, these would be different. This would be 0.12, this would be 0.13. So you gotta be careful, I guess. Um, you know, just work through one. And, uh, you know, if you get it wrong, take a look at how they did it. Take a look at their answer explanation, and then just do the next one in that same exact way. And it should work out. And if it doesn't, let me know and I can go in and you know say that you completed the section. <laughs> All right, so uh, you got that inverse norm, and this is the same thing. No, no, it's not. Objectives changing. All right, this is finding probabilities. So this is using a table. Uh, so I'll do one of these because all these problems are just. This is just finding area under the curve. This is if I'm given certain values on the number line. You know, can I find area under the curve either between two values or to the right of one value to the left of another value? You've done this before, right? You've actually done all this before uh, with your calculator back in chapter six. So the mean number of touchdowns per football game is 3.7, so that's like your mu, with a population standard deviation of 0.9, that's sigma. So a sample of 31 football games, that's n, 
was taken and the probability that the mean number of touchdowns in these 31 games uh, for uh, and the probability that the mean number of touchdowns for the sample will be more than 3.9 was found. Was the probability a left tail, right tail, or interval probability? So are you looking to the left of some value, to the right of some value, or between two values? Well, more than 3.9, that's to the right, that's a right tail. All right, so it's a right tail probability. Uh, what is the probability that the mean number of touchdowns for a sample will be more than 3.9? Right. So you got one of these choices here. So it's definitely a right tail. And again, I'll draw a little picture. All right, I'll draw a little picture of another probability here. All right. And I'll just go to the calculator and show you how we can use the calculator to find this area. You could use a table again, change into Z scores, but so they're telling us, you know, x x bar represents the average the average uh, number of touchdowns in 31 football games. Oh, pardon me. In groups of 31 games. And since that's, you know, it doesn't matter what the original population is, this is a sample size bigger than 30, 30 or greater. So by the central limit theorem, the distribution of these means, this x bar, is normal. And the mean of these x bar, this x bar distribution, the mean of the means, is the mean of the population, which they told us was 3.7. And the standard deviation of these x bars, the means, was the standard deviation of the population, 0 0.9, divided by the square root of the sample size. And I'll draw a little picture. Here's possible different values of these means, you know, average numbers of touchdowns per 31 games. You know, normal, so it's a nice symmetrical bell-shaped curve here. Under the peak should be, you know, 3.7. And then whatever this is, is, you know, under the under the first inflection point. Whatever 0 0.9 divided by square root of 31 is, that's how far away that is from 3.7. Now we're asked, what's the probability? What's the probability that if I take a group of 31 games, if I look at th a group of 31 games, and take the average number of touchdowns in those 31 games, what's the probability that that average is greater than 3.9? Right, so remember, this corresponds to an area. Now 3.9 would be here, and we're talking about this area, right? You know, greater than 3.9. We're talking over here. So it's definitely a right tail. Right, definitely a right tail probability. Now you can change this to a Z score, right? By you know you standardize, change this to a Z score, find that value on a table, get the area to the left, and then subtract that from one, and that'll give you this area to the right. Or, you know, you can use that normal CDF on your calculator. So I'll do that on here normal CDF, right, normal CDF. Now the, the lower value in the region is 3.9. Uh, there is no upper value, so I'm just going to put some large positive number, like five nines here. The mean is 3.7, and the standard deviation was, you know, 0 0.9 divided by the square root of 31. Just enter it as, as is, like that. So we're getting about, you know, 10.8 percent. And I said round to three decimal places. So point, point 0.108, point 0.108. Now, of the choices that I'm given, the closest to point 0.108 is this one. Now, the reason this is off is because they're using the table values, right? The table values are all rounded. My value on the calculator is a little more accurate. So of the, of the choices given to me, the closest one is 0 0.106, definitely a right tail probability. Great. And they show you how I would go through using a table. Right? And I believe that's all, because uh, these last two objectives are using, you know, you can use a calculator to do or, or use these tables to do. So this is the same thing. This is the same exact thing, just with different numbers. Just pay attention to the numbers, maybe draw a picture. Uh, they want you to type out the mean of the means, you know, you, that's the same as the mean of the population. Remember the standard deviation of the x bars is the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the sample size. And then what's the area under the curve between, you know, 173 and 174? And round to, uh, 
probably four decimal places because, oh, they want three, round to three, because all these values in here are to three decimal places. Uh, now, I would be careful, though. I would be careful because they do throw these tables out. So you probably should be using the tables to find these, and hopefully you remember how to do that, right? That's, uh, go back to section 6.1, 6 6.2, one of those where you're finding the area under a curve. I think it was 6.2. I showed you how to use these tables to find the area between two values under a curve. You know, you find the area to the left of one of them, the, the right one. You find the area to the left of the, uh, of the left one, and then you subtract those areas, right? And you're finding those areas using your tables. All right, so you use the calculator to give you a good guess, um, but I think you should use the tables. That way, you know, you're not going to be off of what they want. I think they want you to use the tables here. All right, and, I'll show, and then I'll cheat here and throw those in. And you can see how they're using the tables in the answer explanation below. So I'll kind of slowly go through this, and you can pause and read through all this stuff. Alright, so that's it. All right, I'm just going to kind of cheat through the rest of the way and slowly scroll through if you want to read. All right. Oh, this one's a drag. Alright, so I can't really cheat through this one. Alright, yeah, so this one's going to be uh, moving some junk. Alright. So, an ICU nurse is recording the systolic blood pressure of incoming patients. Assume the systolic blood pressure has an unknown distribution with a mean, right, mu, 110 uh, millimeter, high, you know, mercury millimeters or whatever. I don't know what that unit is really. Uh, well, yeah. And a standard deviation sigma of 12.5. The nurse believes incoming patient systolic blood pressure readings are too high. So if she randomly selects 40 patients, right, so the, the N is 40, and records their systolic blood pressure, what is the probability that the average for these 40 patients uh, from the sample is over 116, you know, mercury millimeters? All right, so it says drag and move the blue dot to select the appropriate probability. Now it's over 116, so that's a right tailed test, right? So down here. And they're telling us, I think. Well, let's see, we have to move other stuff. <laughs> uh, so, appropriate probability graph area from the four options on the left. Note there are four graphs available to choose from, less than, greater than, or area between. Use the central limit theorem to find the mean of the means, the mean of these averages for 40 patients, which would be the same as the mean of the original population, 110. What am I doing with these dots? All right. I think that's all. Uh, and then the standard deviation for the this you know the mean the average for 40 patients would be 12.5 right divided by the square root of 40 round to three decimal places and calculate the z-score for 116 and move the slider along the x-axis to the appropriate z-score ah okay so we have to move the black dot all right so the mean for the means, the mean for the x-bars here, these averages for groups of 40 patients, the average blood pressure for groups of 40 patients is 110. The standard deviation would be, now it says round to three decimal places, so uh, again, it was 12.5 divided by the square root of 40. Pull my calculator up, 12.5 divided by the square root of 40. So it's a three decimal place, 1.976. One point nine seven six And then what would be the, now they wanted the Z score for one sixteen. Alright, so I would take one sixteen, subtract the mean, which is one ten. I don't know why I did that. I know that's six, right? 
and then divide this by the standard deviation of the means there, 1.976, and our z score is you know 3.036, so 3.0. So back on the graph here, I'm going to move this to a z score of 3. Point 3.03, 3.04, looks like. All right, let me just see that. <laughs> let me make sure. Let's see, six divided by. Let's take this number up here instead of 1.976. Blah blah blah. Yeah, 3.04 would still round to. All right, so this I'm gonna move to three. 3.04. Mm, come on. Nope. Ah. Oh, I moved again. Ah. Very sensitive. Oh, gosh. It moved again. Come on. Right, I'm going to pause this until I get it to be at 3.04. Okay, so there, I finally got the black dot to be at 3.04, and the total shaded area, I barely see it, is 0 .0012. Right. Do they want me to enter? I say round of three decimal places, but they give me four. Alright, well, it said round of three, so I'm going to go point zero zero one. Okay, great. So they gave me four, but you know, I said round to three. So you know, pay attention. All right, cool. So they got to move to what kind of area you got, and they move the black dot to the Z score for the the, the 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 score in question for the average in question. Okay. And it looks like right. So yeah, see, so you may use your calculator or a portion of the z, z t tail below, round your answer to three decimal. This is finding a probability again. So drawing pictures, you know, is it what kind of probability are you taking? What's the probability? Okay, and again, just get the closest one, right? Because you remember that my one earlier, it was a little bit off because of my, you know, the calculator is a little more accurate. But just do the closest one. So I'll just do it, do a cheat on that. It's pretty similar to a problem I showed you earlier. And uh, then I believe the last problems are like earlier, where I'm given an area and asked to find a value. Yeah, given a probability, uh, find a mean. All right, so I'm just going to cheat on these. You put in z-score, find that mean, right? You, you should be able to do this. And again, you're trying to figure it out based on, like here, I want the lowest 60% from the highest. So I look for the 0.6 in here, what's closest to 0.6. So you see 0.599, you see how they go 0 0.25, you see they want the closest two without going over. So they have 0 0.25 with the 0 0.599, 60% below. And then using that z-score, find the actual value on the number line that has 60% you know, below, 40% above. Yeah, you should be able to do that based on what I've done previously. Okay, and this is... This is exactly the same, just different numbers. So I'm going to cheat. So let's see if that rule still applies here. They want the bottom 35 from the top 65. So I look for bottom 35, 35 below, 0.35. So there, 0 0.352, 0 0.348. This is the closest without going over. So it looks like the z-score for the thing we're, we're in question here is negative 0.39. Yeah, so they're going closest to without going over. All right, so the price is right rules. And then the actual value itself, right? And again, same, same setup as before. Okay, that looks like about it. So pretty long one there. You know, there are four objectives. It's a very important topic, the central limit theorem. All right, so you know, I knew it was going to be a long one, nice hour and a half here. Uh, 
you know, get those formulas down, understand, hopefully you can under, hopefully understand the central limit theorem after, you know, reading through section 7.1 in your OpenStax book, reading through all the uh, more instructions. Again, I would recommend every time you see a new objective, click on more instruction and read what they got there, watch their videos, take notes. Hopefully, and after watching me too, I'm hopeful, hopefully you get a, a, a reasonable grasp on the central limit theorem for means. Because we're going to see the central limit theorem again in a later section uh, for proportions as well. And we'll talk about proportions and what those are. All right, so hopefully this video is a reasonable guide for you when you go through the assignment on your own. And uh, you know, if you have any questions, of course, let me know. And thank you very much for watching.